Thanks to The Exorcist Believer for sponsoring today's video. Hello, Internet! Welcome to Film Theory, the show that'll turn its head around 180 degrees for any scrap of lore. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time to get dark. Okay, so it's not really all that rare of an event here on the channels, but you know what is a rare event? Us talking about one of the scariest, most influential horror franchises of all time, The Exorcist. In case you don't know this one, these films check off all our main criteria for a banger episode. Kids, check. Possessions, check. And that's the list. The original Exorcist back in the day was a very important movie because it legitimized the horror genre for mainstream audiences. Well, also, given the chiropractic industry its first ever viral video, Oh, just felt that one. It also gave a much needed boost to the pea soup makers of the world. <laughs> Mm-mm-mm. Tasty. And now this year, a new chapter begins. The Exorcist Believer, releasing in theaters on October 6th. In this new movie, two teenage girls disappear for three days, and when they're found, something's changed. They act strange. Their personalities are a bit darker, and their parents eventually realize that, in true exorcist fashion, they've been possessed by a demon. In their terror and desperation, they seek out the only person alive who's witnessed anything like this before. Chris McNeil, mother to Regan from the original story 50 years ago. So Already you're dealing with a tried and true premise, except this time, it's multiplied by two. Truly, teamwork makes the dream work, even in the realm of demonic possession. But then the exorcist believer decided to take it another step further. While the original 1973 was predominantly written from a Catholic perspective on demonic possession and exorcism, Believer brings in the perspective from multiple faiths. Catholicism, for sure, but also the Pentecostal church, the Baptist church, even root medicine from Africa. As Chris McNeil says in the new movie, exorcism is one of the oldest human rituals. Every Every culture, in every country for as far back as history has been recorded, has a ceremony to dispel negative energies. And that right there, that is really cool. Having the new movie feature exorcisms across different belief systems, it not only educates the audience on multiple faiths in a fun, this doesn't even feel like learning sort of way, something that you know we always stand on the theorist channels, but it also opens the door to some intensely scary entities. So I wanted to do a bit of a thought experiment today. What if we take things just a little step further? The first movie featured Regan getting possessed by the Mesopotamian wind spirit Pazuzu. And now this newest movie's demonic entity is introducing another Mesopotamian spirit known as Lamashtu, daughter of the sky god and often depicted alongside Pazuzu. They're kind of like total besties, with Lamashtu causing nightmares, attacking pregnant women, and corrupting bodies of water. In short, these characters aren't just being possessed by your regular old garden variety Satan, they're very specific demons from a very specific time and place. So if suddenly the door's open for bringing in other faiths, what is the biggest, baddest possession entity that we could face in a future installment. What are some other demons and spirits that could make their silver screen appearance in a future exorcist movie? And which of them would present the biggest challenge for any would-be exorcists looking to bring them down? Cause sometimes holy water and crosses just aren't enough. Basically, I wanna know who would be the final boss of the exorcist films. Hold your crucifix close and start praying, loyal theorists. The power compels ya to keep watching. Also, right off the bat, I wanna say that what we're covering today are real faiths held by real people with an incredible amount of nuance, detail, and regional difference. I want to make it perfectly clear that this is a very top-line, surface-level discussion that's meant to be fun while sparking some creative interest in spooky stuff. We just think it'd be cool to see some of these spirits and their faiths represented on screen. And of course, when that would happen, the filmmakers would consult people of those faiths to ensure that everything is authentic. I just want to flag that since, you know, this is a short online video that's touching on religion and faith. So just keep that in mind as we roll forward. The first faith I wanted to bring in here today is Islam, considering it's one of the most practiced religions on the planet with nearly 25% of Earth's population identifying as Muslim. And while not all Muslims believe in exorcisms, or Rukhaya as they call them, there are plenty of stories that have circulated throughout the faith. For instance, there was one story from 2021 that involved a married couple in Jakarta moving into a home haunted by evil, the wife becoming possessed, and the couple turning to three Muslim experts to perform an exorcism. So what could potentially be doing the possession here? Well, within Islam, there are spiritual creatures creatures known as jinn, probably better known by their other name, genies. Yeah, you heard that right, but hold your Robin Williams there, friends. These are not your typical celebrity impersonating blue wisps of smoke. In fact, there are many different types appearing across hundreds of different stories. In the Quran alone, there are 29 different mentions of jinn, but records of their existence actually date back to pre-Islamic Arabia. Jinn, in general, don't tend to be innately good or evil. Instead, they tend to have free will and can thus decide on their moral course of action. That said, there are a few in the stories that are 
explicitly called out as being evil. The Afrit, for instance, are beings of fire coming from the underworld. There's also the Shaitan, evil devils that lack free will but work to tempt humans to sin. And these jinn are known to possess humans, though the reasons can vary drastically. It could be as simple as the human offended them or the jinn just wanted to cause trouble, to them falling in love with a human and wanting to be loved in return. Sometimes even spirits aren't immune to toxic relationships. So that's what we're dealing with. But if we're truly gonna identify which is the final boss of exorcism, we need to know how to evict these guys from our bodies. Modern strategies for dealing with jinn amount to reciting verses from the Quran. Nothing too extreme there. According to Georgetown University Associate Professor Amira El Zen, pre-Islamic Arabs would use a combination of beads, incense, salt, and necklaces made from the bones and teeth of animals to frighten jinn away. Again, pretty easy stuff to come by. According to one study, which looked across various exorcisms performed by Arab Muslim healers, they found that exorcisms tended to be divided up into three stages. Step one, remove all distractions, including music, jewelry, and pictures. Step two, cleanse the room and try to communicate with the jinn about their reason for the possession. Then finally, step three, recite the Quran and ask the jinn to leave. And uh, yeah, that is basically it. Not to be too reductive here, guys, but jinn, honestly, they're pretty casual. You clean up the room a bit, you talk about their problems, and then you ask them to go away. They just need to be heard, guys. They want to vent, you know? And interestingly enough, I saw this theme pop up a lot across my research. In the story of the fisherman and the jinni, part of the famous folk tales from 1001 Nights, a fisherman finds a bottle containing an afrit. The afrit threatens to kill the fisherman, but the fisherman manages to negotiate a peaceful resolution that gets both the fisherman and the jinn what they want. Seriously, an exorcist negotiating with the jinn and both parties walking away with a win-win scenario. Sounds more like a conflict resolution meeting with HR than the big final bad of some spooky exorcism story. So what other cultures have a rich history of demons and possessions that we can draw from? Well, next up on the world tour is the Shinto, the indigenous religion of Japan, a faith that holds a lot of reverence for nature and the spirits that inhabit it. Many Shinto practices seek to communicate with and appease those spirits, so you can already see how this might fit in with an exorcist story. See, in Shintoism, everyone has a reikon, similar to the western idea of a spirit or a soul. However, when someone dies suddenly, their reikon can struggle to move on, instead transforming into a yurai, similar to the western concept of a ghost. The yurai are often driven by very powerful emotions, revenge, jealousy, love, sorrow, and it's through resolving that emotional conflict that the spirit can finally be laid to rest. Another interesting option here is appealing to the spirit's ego. I found one story where the 12th century emperor Satoku died and became a vengeful spirit haunting his court, only for them to exorcise him by treating him like a demigod. This calmed him enough that his spirit ultimately departed. So yet again, we get ourselves an exorcism scenario that's less about throwing holy water at a child doing crab walks on the ceiling, and more about having a cup of tea with someone on the couch to talk about their feelings. Not exactly big screen worthy stuff. But while we're busy having tea and cakes with the Yurai, there is another class of supernatural entities that could lead to far more unique forms of exorcism. Those are known as the yokai. And though the word can translate literally to demon, they're not really demons in the western sense of the word. Instead, they're more like spirits that represent natural parts of the world, or phenomenon that can't be explained. As such, there are hundreds of different yokai, each with their own personality. For example, sukumogami are possessed tools ranging from futons and mirrors to shoes and jars, while other yokai, like kitsune fox spirits, have been known to possess human beings and cause them to take on the physical characteristics of a fox. So how then would an exorcist deal with these yokai? A sort of general term for a Shinto exorcism or purification is harai, which is meant to cleanse one of their sins, bad luck, diseases, and guilt along with exercising any spirits possessing them. One common way of doing this, water. Water, and especially fresh, clean water, is believed to have purifying properties that can wash away evil and restore balance. We're talking things like washing hands, pouring water over the body, rinsing out your mouth. Basically, you're treating the yokai like a case of COVID-19. Stay healthy and hashtag stop the spread of mischievous spirits. That said, there are other more elaborate ceremonies known as misogi that can be used for particularly stubborn spirits. These feature participants dressing in special white garments and gathering in sacred places like shrines and waterfalls to chant, meditate, and pray away the yokai. The possessed person is immersed in cold water to cleanse away any impurities while the ritual's performed, which involves a lot of clapping, bowing, and prayer to try and drive out the possessing demon. But if that's still not enough, well, thankfully, there's tools of the trade to use if things become more confrontational. These include the afuda, a sort of talisman made from paper or cloth meant to keep people in places safe, the gohei, wooden wands with zigzagging paper streamers representing the presence of the divine, and the katana, a traditional Japanese sword symbolizing power and strength, allowing the exorcist to cut through negative energies. An exorcist with a sword, huh? Put that one on your next blockbuster movie poster. That is awesome. However, across all my research, there was one spirit that 
truly stood out as the biggest and baddest of the bunch. One that appears to be far more violent and far more fearsome than the rest. The definitive final boss of any exorcist story, hailing from Native American folklore, specifically coming from the indigenous peoples of the plains and Great Lakes, I'm talking about the Wendigo. Now the thing about the Wendigo is that they have been misappropriated to heck and back by a lot of mainstream media, so what is with the Wendigo exactly? Well, the Wendigo is, traditionally speaking, a spirit of winter, and a symbol of the dangers of selfishness. It's often said to be a malevolent spirit which sometimes chooses to possess human beings, invoking feelings of insatiable greed and hunger. Probably the most iconic trait of the spirit is that it causes the victim to turn cannibal. Despite their depiction as creatures similar to werewolves or yetis in a lot of pop culture, according to most native legends, the physical form of the Wendigo is actually very human-like, oftentimes with hearts of ice. Some describe the Wendigo as having bodies entirely made of ice. They're gaunt and emaciated, so hungry for human flesh that they've chewed their own lips off. Whenever a Wendigo would eat another person, they would grow in proportion to what they just consumed so they could never truly be full. It also means that over time, Wendigos grow to be gigantic. So how does one become possessed by a Wendigo? Well, there's actually a few methods. You could be specifically cursed by a shaman, you can encounter a Wendigo in your dreams where it follows you into the real world, or probably the most common method I've seen floating around is that it's punishment for some sort of dishonorable act, breaking a major taboo, like resorting to cannibalism during a time of starvation. So what do we know about exercising a Wendigo spirit? Well, here's the thing, in almost every case I could find, you can't. Once someone becomes possessed and transformed into a Wendigo, there's no coming back. This isn't a sit down on the couch and talk about your feelings kind of possession. A quick mouth rinse with water ain't washing this one away. The solution in the stories that I read was to kill the possessed so they can't continue their cannibalistic murder rampage. It is that hardcore. In short, the Wendigo is a spirit that cannot be exercised, which honestly is pretty darn horrifying. Even more horrifying though is that this isn't just something that exists in folklore. It is a real thing. There's actually a modern psychiatric condition that borrows its name from these stories. It's called Wendigo psychosis, and it's characterized by an intense fear of becoming a cannibal while suffering from intense cravings for human flesh. First off, that right there, that could play really well in some sort of exorcist story with the Wendigo spirit. Maybe some of the characters are suffering from this Wendigo psychosis without actually being possessed, mixing in a bit of mystery as to who's the one truly in need of help. But diving even more deeply into the psychosis, I did find treatments of the condition in some Cree folklore. Here, they ate fatty animal meat and drank animal grease in an attempt to drive the psychosis out of the patient. As the stories go, some of the people who were treated this way would allegedly vomit up ice as part of the curing process. Given that the Wendigo, the spirit of winter, is supposed to have a heart made of ice, a pretty easy connection to draw there. Maybe the cured is literally throwing up the ice heart of the Wendigo. So in total, across our spiritual battle, we have talk about your feelings, wash your hands, throw up a heart made of ice. I think I know which on that list is going to be the most difficult to accomplish. Wendigo wins the exorcist battle, hands down. At this point, you could probably tell Chris McNeil was 100% right in the exorcist believer, when she said that every culture on earth has purification rituals like exorcisms, each as intricate and unique as the last. Just from these three cultures alone, we have wildly different spirits that can all possess you in different ways with markedly different strategies of exorcism. And that was without even touching on the faiths that were represented in the exorcist believer. But that's because you should probably go see it for yourself when the film comes out in theaters this Friday. I certainly know I'll be there hiding behind my hands. These movies are scary, man. But until then, remember, my friends, it's all just a theory. A film theory. And cut.